presentation and being a part of this course and giving your lecture yes, now. So I, it's all yours. So I'd like to thank uh, Professor Shivasta for giving me this opportunity to talk to this uh, group of people. And uh, usually uh, I like to know my audience. So I understand uh, Professor Shivasta, these are college teachers. Uh, from different institutes, most of them colleges, some are research institutes as well. Uh, so I will take more oh. of the detailed uh, presentation from the participant at the end of the uh, you know today's session because everybody is on uh, time track and Rodrigo also has to give him from the Spain on a different time. So okay, right, right. no, no, I'll uh, keep to time. I just uh, I no, just no, wanted right. to know whether they're all the teachers. We skip their uh, presentations. You know, I had asked all the participants to make a short one slide presentation to give their background. Right. So we will actually record that and share with you as well. Uh, but yeah, right, they're right. all so, engineering faculty members from different colleges and some institutes. That, that is good enough. Yes, that, that's all I right. wanted to know. So, so I'm very happy to always to talk to uh, teachers because then uh, there is a possibility that we will continue this conversation and we will, um, of course, right now is not a good time, but you are, my doors are always open at IIT Bombay. And so is Professor Shivasta. We are very open people. So we would like to communicate to you if there are any uh, areas of uh, we can work together. We can do that certainly. And one of the things uh, that is very important is that uh, there are some laboratories here. Again, these laboratories right now are not in full operational mode, but uh, they allow people from all over India to come and join and uh, work together. So this is called Indian Nano User Program, INUP. Uh, so we have a nano lab where you can fabricate uh, many of these components that I will be talking about today. So today uh, we are going to present on uh, bioimaging systems and uh, plan to uh, look at aspects of microarray imaging and then design, fabrication and test of components which go into a microarray. So this is an ongoing work which is <clears throat> being sponsored by the Department of Biotechnology and is being done in collaboration with Professor Shivastav in Department of Biosciences and Bioengineering at IIT Bombay. And the other people who are also involved in this sort of work are uh, Professor Ashutosh Kumar, Professor Mayuri Gandhi, Professor Kushal Takle, all of them at IIT Bombay and Professor S.S. Prabhu and Professor Viji Achanta at Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, TIFR, which is based in Mumbai. And my email IDs are given for your reference and you can contact me. Wish. So this lecture is delivered as part of e-courses conducted through Knowledge Incubation under take it 3 program, which is uh, funded by the Ministry of Education, Government of India and the World Bank. So this is the overview of my lecture. So we will be talking about roughly three types of domains. One is the background where we talk about this is something that we have been working on for the last uh, five and ten years on microsystems engineering and based on that what we call non uniform illumination or NUI imaging. And uh, we have now moved on to microarray imaging. We will discuss some aspects of that without going into the finer details, because as I understand, most of you are from engineering background, which is similar to mine. You know, we have very little knowledge of biology and whatever we know, you know, we know courtesy of our students and courtesy of our colleagues in biosciences. So that is a um, ongoing process. So we will talk about a few aspects of microarray imaging and then in the third module we will discuss on microarray engineering and there we are basically putting together a toolkit which allows you to do imaging under so called hostile ambient conditions that means there is substantial present of noise and how to put these systems together what are the downsides what are you know, uh, the opportunities, we will talk about that in brief. So this is the background on which, uh, from which we have basically developed our knowledge towards imaging technologies, mapping technologies, sensing technologies, what have you. And it uh, comes in three kinds of main domains, 
Sets are subdomains which are imaging based on mobile, airborne, and waterborne platforms, which are powered with multi sensor networks and which are having solar power, so they are autonomous. And they have cameras such as visible and infrared cameras to take uh, long range images and high resolution images. So this is one aspect. Then remote temperature mapping, which we uh, do with a technology called uh, terahertz on an RF pencil beam and using avalanche photodiode arrays. And then uh, biofluid monitoring, <coughs> the molecular sensing using infrared optocoupler devices and whispering gallery mode resonators. And uh, this work has been sponsored by the Department of Defense, Indian government and Tata Computer Services, and then US Air Force and Department of Biotechnology and Nipro, which is a Japanese uh, company. So the main areas where we have been historically focused on and that is relevant to our work, and that's why this is all part of our background, is uh, fabrication, testing, and design of radiation sensors, and which goes into what we call a non-uniform illumination flux map. So we will talk about this quite a bit, and this is relevant for this biological application as well. Then we have done uh, precision cooling, so in electronics and uh, many applications, cooling is very important for enhanced performance and for reduction of noise. And even that is also important in bioimaging as well. We have worked on on-chip power using microfuel cells. Uh, in this case, it is not so important. However, we are developing a compact power supply for our bioimaging toolkit, and we will be talking about that as well. And finally, we have developed lens antennas, which uh, generate a so-called steerable pencil beam. And these are used for imaging, temperature images. Uh, and we will talk about that as well. And all this uh, design, fabrication, and testing of uh, components, which has gone on over the last five years, um, there have been four US patents which have been granted, as well as four Indian patents. And uh, the total number of publications are 90 with the uh, associated citations of 2221 and 12 PhD scholars have been working on this various aspects of these applications. So first uh, module, as we say, is imaging principles and related applications. So in this uh, we will talk about essentially this uh, large area radiation map which could be two dimension or three dimension in nature. So the two dimension is the solar map, which we will talk about shortly. And what that basically says is that you have solar cells and there is sunlight which is incident on it. And let us say there is a cloud pattern which is coming in between. And thereby what you get is a non-uniformly illuminated solar array. So why is this an array? Because you have rows and columns of solar modules which are connected to each other. And the performance of this solar array is very much dependent on this non-uniform illumination, which is dynamic in nature. So this is one application of uh, NUI mapping, as we call it. And then the other form where we have done a lot of work is let us say you have a reactor. In this particular case, it happened to be a nuclear reactor because we were working with Mahabha Atomic Research Center. And there what we are doing is, well, nobody will allow you to go map inside the reactor, right? But what they will permit you is to put sensors on the exterior of the reactor. So this looks like a bangle, right? And this bangle is three dimensional in nature. And the idea there is it would map the flux of neutrons which are generated inside the reactor. So this neutron density is very large, maybe 10 to the power 12 or 10 to the power 17 per centimeter cube and centimeter square, I'm sorry. And then uh, these are traveling very fast and uh, those thermal neutrons are to be detected using specific detectors. And here I should mention uh, one thing which is a substantial matter of pride for us is uh, pretty much most of the technologies 
we develop in our own laboratory and we design it, we fabricate it, we test it. And on occasions, of course, uh, if these are, for example, large areas, solar cells or thermocouples that we um, source from the outside. But generally speaking, uh, design and test is fully in our control. And for many of these devices, uh, fabrication also. So we would like to do end-to-end -end, uh, capture of the technology, and that helps in our understanding, and that helps in optimization of the systems, and that helps in further progress. So we can also migrate to different domains, as you can shortly see. So with these airborne platforms, there are different types. Uh, there could be drones, there could be kites, and gliders, and aerostats. So if it is a uh, long range imaging, we have mounted sensors and cameras on aerostats. And uh, thereby, what you get is we uh, map these solar modules and we map the, uh, what sort of power that they are generating. And this changes with uh, the contour of these modules. So they may they not be laid out flat, right? So they could be in contoured form and uh, that changes with time, that changes with daytime, with year time, with contour, with temperature. So there are multiple parameters which determine the power output of the solar modules. And uh, here is essentially what the uh, power of imaging that we would like to adopt. So this is a schematic which illustrates the concept. So here you have a footprint of a cloud, right? This is an array of solar modules as we are talking about. They are connected in series and parallel combination. So then the effective footprint of the cloud is shown by this dashed line, shaded line. And then effectively what it happens is that the some of the modules are under different sorts of illumination. So you can see brightly illuminated modules. You can see very dark modules. And then there are some gray modules. So what we do there is what was the philosophy there is that you segregate out the modules. So the bright ones you disconnect uh, from their original connection and you reconnect them. So this is a reconfigurable solar photovoltaic array. And what we have shown by this, uh, this has been a very uh, productive area for us. What we have shown is that this is of course a dynamic thing as well. The switching and unswitching has to proceed in a dynamic manner. And uh, depending on how the image is projected, how accurately we read the image, how quickly we uh, reconfigure the arrays, we can see as much as 50% additional power generated under non-uniform illumination conditions. So this is basically the concept. So you have sunlight illuminating, then you have 2D intensity patterns, and then we compute uh, the non-uniform illumination, and then we switch the circuits, and then we get uh, renewed power output. And uh, in terms of uh, ability to map remotely, so this is based on an aerostat image, which we are using both uh, visible and infrared cameras. And what you're doing there is you are doing spectroscopy essentially. And all of you who are having background uh, a little bit background in science. So spectroscopy basically means intensity in the y-axis versus amplitude or uh, wavelength or frequency in the x-axis. So here you can see a car, which is a yellow car in the parking lot. And then you can see that there is a substantial yellow signal. So these are um, concepts which we will all use uh, in biomarker array imaging, where again, we have light which is incident, which excites the ligands and uh, you have to collect the light in a useful manner and you have to remove the noise. So high resolution imaging is very much a requirement. So the next uh, technology module that we want to talk about again in background is uh, this RF terahertz pencil beam for generation of thermal maps. And there what we have is a traditional Antenna design, I think you are all familiar with the word antenna. It essentially transmits radiation, electromagnetic radiation. And depending on the antenna dimensions, this uh, radiation can be of different frequencies. So a good rule of thumb is that if you have a three gigahertz beam, right, which is uh, your normal mobile antennas are 
one gigahertz. So if it's a three gigahertz frequency, then uh, it is 10 centimeters in diameter. That is the lambda wavelength of the antenna. So generally the antenna dimensions are lambda by two, lambda by four, etc. So what happens is that here you have a joined antenna actually. So here you have a horn antenna from which the original signal appears. And then you have a parabolic antenna which basically uh, captures that signal and then reflects it back and then it does it in a way that there is interference and then essentially you have a collimation of the outgoing radiated beam. So in the far field it will look like a pencil beam. And similar to the reconfigurable structure that we had discussed in the solar modules that uh, previously we talked about, here we have a reconfigurable cells which allow you to interfere, cross interfere and create this far field radiated beam. So this is essentially shown in simulation that you have uh, this structure, which is uh, our uh, contribution to this work, that we actually did not uh, want a parabolic structure, we wanted a planar structure, and it still uses a horn antenna for excitation. And then what you see is that uh, there is the configurable uh, pixels which interfere and generate a pencil beam. And if you are able to capacitively couple to the pixels, then you can also steer this beam. So it's a steerable pencil beam application. And so this is the actual structure which was fabricated in our laboratory. So this is called a reflect array antenna. It's a prototype. And then this is the radiation pattern. So some of you who are from electro electronics and um, electromagnetics background will be able to follow this. So you have this radiation pattern. And then the idea is that, uh, what are we going to do with this pencil beam? So what you have is a patch, which is a polymeric material on which you have mounted a series of avalanche photodiodes, which work as temperature sensors. And what sort of sensitivity they're given are uh, evident from this uh, characterization. So you get 35 millivolts for every change of Kelvin. So one Kelvin temperature change generates 35 millivolts. So since electronics wise, we are able to detect, say for example, one millivolt very easily. So you can imagine that our resolution is something like 0 0.03 Kelvin or 30 millikelvin. So that is very good. So the idea there is that uh, these are avalanche photodiodes, which are, again, if you are forming an electronics background, you would understand this, that you have uh, operating in the avalanche breakdown mode. And then what you do is you bias it at the breakdown. And then if there is a small change in the ambient condition, this could be light, thereby this also counts as a photon detector, right? It is an avalanche photodiode, right? So if there is a very small number of photons, it can detect that. And if there is a small temperature change, it can also detect that. And the idea is simple, that you are moving from uh, off position to an on position, right? You are biased at the breakdown. So in one direction, it is completely off. And in the other direction, it is completely on. That is assuming an ideal diode characteristic. So basically in terms of an analog circuit, it also works like an amplifier. So it basically boosts the signal, the very small signal which is generated. And again, this generation signal generation is due to an external trigger, which can happen because of incident photons, so that this can work as a very uh, sensitive photon detector or because of a small change in temperature. So it can also work as a very sensitive temperature detector. As we said, one Kelvin of temperature change will essentially reflect in 30 millivolts of, um, sorry, uh, one millivolt will reflect in 30 millikelvins of temperature change. So uh, this is of course uh, using a, a FLIR camera that we have. So this is a commercial camera. And what it is showing is that it shows hot spots which are generated on a surface and that you are mapping from a distance. And then this work, what we are proposing is that um, 
is you have the pencil beam which is incident on the surface and is able to measure that temperature change and this beam comes back and tells you uh, what what is the hot spots which are developing and it is essentially a replacement a proposed replacement for the infrared camera which is measuring hot spots on a surface so this is one more example which shows that what we are interested in, what are the things we are interested in, in terms of imaging. Now these images can be done remotely as with the cameras mounted on the airborne platforms. They can be done proximately. So this sort of thermal maps can be done. All of you I think are now familiar with COVID testing. So you have this device which is pointed at you and gives you the temperature. So this is kind of a similar device that we are talking about. So maybe the displacement is tens of centimeters, right? And in the other imaging that we talked about, the solar imaging there, the distances are in tens of meters. And uh, this coming brings us to our third module of discussion, which is the terahertz or infrared based sensing for toxic gas and for biofluids. And uh, here the again, it is a issue of mapping of uh, the properties of the ambient that you're detecting. So this could be a toxic gas such as methane or it could be alcohol, ethanol, right? It could be, so it, this could be a gaseous media. This could be some chemicals which you are coating. This could be some biofluids. So in all of these things, uh, we are able to use uh, the so-called resonator devices, which are sensors and can be also configured as imaging devices. And uh, these whispering gallery modes essentially are a very good example is if you go to any such structure. So you may know this Golgumba structure, which is in Vijayapura in Karnataka. There are many similar structures like the Victoria Memorial in Kolkata and uh, the Taj Mahal, of course. Right. So there, if you have some privacy, which uh, there may be possible in the COVID days, then you can go to a wall and if you're able to excite the modes properly, if you whisper, this uh, same whispering sound will come right back to you after traveling the entire perimeter of the um, structure. So this part of whispering gallery modes can be used for resonator devices, which we have developed in our laboratory. And uh, essentially what you do there is there is some coating of material, which could be a very, very thin coating, uh, very sensitive uh, measurement. And what you do there is you generate a beam, right? And uh, this beam comes and interacts with this um, structure. In this case, it is a sphere and which is coated with a chemical. And then what it does, it interacts with interfaces with the surface. So as you can, as we shall shortly discuss in the biomapping also, the surface is very important, right, for us to map. And what are the structures on the surface? What are the ligands in the case of biology here? These are different things, different chemicals which are being excited. And then if the whispering gallery modes are excited, then you can essentially see that the waves will travel around and then they will, if it is a resonating structure, then you will see short peak shifts because of the analytes. So these similar analytes, not exactly the same, but uh, different types of analytes are used in biological experiments as well. So what we are looking for here is a measurement of the analyte concentration, right, which will be useful for our studies. So all of this is essentially to uh, give you the basic background from where we are originating, which is in engineering. And there we are looking at essentially light, non-uniform intensity of light, and then non-uniform uh, flux maps for temperature, and then for chemical species. And all of this will be of use when we go for microarray imaging. So this is uh, for people who are from similar engineering backgrounds as us, and uh, who are facing biological challenges the uh, first time after they have left uh, biology at class 10, similar to us. There, you know, it would be useful, you know, to use whatever knowledge you have and then apply it to new things. So this, I hope, will be useful in that sense. 
So now we go into microarray imaging, which is our second module. And uh, there we are talking about the some fundamentals of image processing. So even if you don't have a background in this area, I hope you'll be able to understand some parts of it. So essentially you have an image which uh, so far we have been discussing. It's a 2D representation of the physical world. And of course an image is broken up into pixels. And then there are various operations which we can perform. So this is uh, extraction of features, right? So there are specific features. So if you think of a human face, right? Or if you think of uh, temperature pattern or if you think of sunlight intensity. So these are all features, right? So you have dark areas, you have light areas. So these would be features. You are talking about a footprint of a cloud. If you remember, we were talking about that. So this would be a feature, right? Next, what you have is in the image, you want to enhance the contrast when you want to analyze it. And the reason for that is that the image that you may have that you have captured may have low contrast you want to make it a higher contrast to make your analysis more fruitful you may want to restore the image if it is degraded and you may want to compress the images for transmission so for example when we are talking about these uh, remote images if you remember based on the airborne platforms we have a choice right we can have cameras mounted on these aerostats which are fixed in the air and which are maybe at 100 meters at 1000 meters height and the images that will be captured will not be high resolution in nature right so then the alternative is to have drones which fly at a low level and can take very high resolution images but then they have to be broadcast right they have to be broadcast to a base station and that broadcasting typically will require some amount of compression which will again cause some of some information to be lost but if you do the compression in a proper manner then you minimize this sort of loss of information so here we talk about a few aspects so as we talked about contrast if it is poor contrast this can be because these illumination levels are poor right so when we are doing this sort of uh, biomarker imaging, of course, we are using, you know, uh, excitation sources like lasers and LEDs. And it may happen that, you know, uh, over time, these uh, lasers, the intensity of this light may go down and that may cause poor illumination. So uh, contrast may happen because of your equipment is having some uh, health problems. So we call this uh, system health monitoring, right? So when the equipment works fine, there is no issues of contrast. But if you see poor contrast, then it's maybe because you are having problems with your equipment. But of course, sometimes uh, there may be problems with your sample preparation as well. And then you have to improve this contrast, right? So it is difficult to identify features in this sort of scenario. So how do you do that? So this is a very uh, kind of a straightforward mechanism. So what you do is uh, for people who are having background in electronics, I can perhaps uh, my explanation will be a little bit easier for you, is that we essentially do a threshold and there you have pixels with intensity. So this is an entire area, right? So you can call it a micro array if you want. So it's an array and then you have sub arrays, then you have blocks and then you have pixels. So pixels are the smallest uh, features that you can resolve. So then what you have is in these pixels, you have some, uh, the intensity of the illumination which is outgoing is below this threshold that you have set. And then for the others you have above. So then when you want to enhance the contrast, so you do what is called stretching of the intensity level. So which are the low intensity pixels, right? You apply a mathematical function, so they are further suppressed. So this could be log, for example. So if it is x, then log x will be a suppression of those values. And then the pixels which have intensities higher than the threshold, then you can boost them. So this uh, would be done by perhaps an anti-log or an exponential function. 
So in electronics analogy, uh, we call it bucking and boosting. And if you are familiar with transformers, it is called step up and step down. So something similar we are doing, except that this sort of uh, thresholding is first required to identify the pixel set, which is at lower intensity, which you want to suppress, and then pixels which are at higher intensity where you want to boost. So image restoration is where you have a degraded image, right? The original image is FXY, and the degraded image is GXY, and uh, HXY is the degradation function. So if this is all uh, good mathematics and you have full knowledge, then you know that you are having GXY, and then if you just apply H inverse, then you should be able to go back to FXY, right? But uh, in reality, it is not as straightforward as that. So again, to use our solar photovoltaic uh, non-uniform imaging analogy. So what we say is that, you know, you measured the power, right? So whatever is the external input the, from the physical world, you have finally an output. And most of the things that we uh, discuss here would be either in terms of images or some other electrical signal. So if it is power as a signal, so this is the problem that the power is going down in your system, right? This is what I was mentioning a little while ago that the contrast is low, right? So what can be the reasons for that? It could be because your sunlight intensity is low, right? Why is the sunlight intensity low? Because there is some clouds, right? So this is perfectly possible. On the other hand, it could be that your solar cell itself is degrading. If it is degrading, then it will, uh, even under bright light, it will generate low amount of power. So this sort of distinction you will have to make. In the context of uh, bioimaging, it would be the light source intensity as opposed to the analyte preparation that you have. So there, essentially, we are questioning that, you know, why the degradation is happening. Is that degradation happening in a linear manner? Is it happening in a non-linear manner? So within electrical engineering, you have this problem. Essentially, for linear systems, we have a device called a Kalman filter, which essentially keeps tracking the output data and then actually predicts that based on this sort of knowledge that you have, what would be the future degradation, right? And from that, you can always capture the original data. So a lot of work has been done in that sort of an area. So so image restoration can be can also take help of these sort of models. But of course, you would have to have inner knowledge, right? Which would come from having multiple sensors, which tells you that what actually is going on. We have now talked about image compression, um, that what is the requirement for image compression? Sometimes you are having data which has to be transmitted. In the case of uh, solar models, we talked about images captured via drones, which needs to go to the base station. In this uh, microarray systems, we are talking about building portable kits, which can be used even in villages, if it can be produced at low cost. And then those images need to be transmitted to hospital where the doctors can analyze these images. So that will require image compression techniques. And uh, there are several uh, techniques which build into image compression that you can identify redundancy, right? So for example, if you're looking at a blank wall, right? So let us say this wall is your entire image. So what you can do is you can take an image of a small block, which represents the entire wall. And you can say that, you know, this I'm taking, it's a small image and you just replicate it and that is my entire wall. And uh, of course, if you do that, you are, it could be, susceptible to errors. So what you could do is you can take that block as a basic frame, right? So it's a basic image, and then you can move around the wall, right? And you can do this, for example, with the pencil beam that we are talking about, and you can probe, right, different parts of the wall. And then what you can say is, okay, so everything looks pretty much the same. However, there are small differences, right? So then what you'd say is that I'm going to now transmit only the differences, not the entire block every time. So the main block goes, you know, which captures most of the information. 
and then the subsequent information which is quite small okay for the adjoining blocks right for the remaining blocks which make up the wall there you transmit only the difference images so that is a one way to uh, get the entire information without compromising on the image quality and you can also use various filtering techniques you can use uh, low pass filters these are ele again electronics concepts in electronics you can use high pass filters uh, for uh, manipulating your images for transforming your images and then you know this is how it looks like so you have this image and then if you apply the low pass filtering function you see that it has been smoothened right so that is actually a technical term in imaging it has been smoothened so uh, this you can say is kind of like averaging out you know adjacent pixels so that is what a smoothening effect is on the other hand if you apply a high pass uh, filter then it looks very interesting so you basically see the profile of this lady right so you can see the boundary so high pass filters are good for detection of boundaries and detection of edges while low pass filters is good for interpolations and smoothening as we had talked about so this is the impact of high pass and low pass filters so next thing that you can do and uh, it's frequently uh, very useful in image processing is segmentation so remember that there are various features we talked about so this could be features of a cloud in our solar imaging concept. It could be temperature hotspots in our temperature map. It could be uh, concentration of analytes in bioimaging. So these are features of your image. And then you're distinguishing them by the intensity value of the pixels, right? So you're shining light and that causes excitation of the analytes. And then this excitation is measured. If you remember, we talked about spectroscopy. So essentially intensity as a function of wavelength. So then what we have is, so you have uh, various intensive pixels, and then we separate out the pixels, right? And then we create a grayscale image, convert it into black and white, right? And then this could be a mean based method, and this could be also a median based method, right? So this is a very uh, interesting question for most of us, you know, who have left statistics behind. So I have one, two, three, four. So what would be the mean and what would be the median? So you can calculate that and let me know. So the next thing, uh, next technique that we find to be useful in imaging is uh, thresholding and uh, what we can do we can start with a two level thresholding by level right so you thresh a threshold earlier if you remember we had set a single level right and what were we doing there when we set a single level threshold we set pixels which are intensity lower than the threshold and pixels which are intensity higher than the threshold and we were increasing the contrast right we were stretching the intensity by suppressing the low intense ones and boosting the high intense pixels. And here what we are doing is again a two level thresholding. And what it doing is it is enhancing the contrast and you can see these ring like structures which are white. So uh, the microarray basically is a glass slide which has biological probes. And there are many, many, many such probes, maybe thousands. Okay, and this I think Professor Shivasa mentioned that you have multiple assays at one go. What you do is you smear analytes on it, and then there is a hybridization which happens because the analyte pairs with the, uh, sorry, the ligands, the pair with the, yes, the analytes and the ligands pair up. So uh, what you have, this is the analyte preparation, which uh, we don't get into much. It is the uh, scientists, uh, students with Professor Shivastav, they do this sort of thing. So you get from blood, you get blood serum, then you get RNA, you get messenger RNA, from that you get complementary DNA, and then you get to the test samples where you smear on the arrays. And then you probe, 
Sorry to interrupt, yes. but we have some but session have for them session to get a sense of the experiment. Okay, we will we will go very uh, quickly over these things. I'm just explaining it because next we will talk about the microarray system design. So these are elementary parts of that. So that's why I'm just going over it. This is being done in a very brief manner. So uh, there are different ways of excitation and the standard way that we have adopted for our instrumentation is to use green and red lasers and you get fluorescence which is captured by the detector and these are multi-channel detectors so you can detect the red uh, excitation and the green excitation. So now what you have is if the green hybridizes the ligand and analyte you would see green fluorescence. If the red analyze hybridizes you will see red fluorescence and if it is half and half so as an example you can take you know, a green color, red, green color, and you can mix it with a red color. Then you will see that yellow color, right? So if both hybridizes, then you'll get yellow fluorescence. If none of them hybridizes, then you will get no fluorescence. And the degree of hybridization can be measured by the intensity of the red and the green. And then what you have essentially is these are, you know, images which uh, from Professor Shivastov's lab, proteomics lab. And what you have here is the green channel image and the red channel image. And this is the resolution 1800 by 550 pixels. And this is the capabilities of the GenePix uh, instrument, which is in the uh, proteomics lab. And uh, the features are given, specifications are given. So again, hybridization means uh, of the ligand and the analyte means colored spots, no hybridization means dark spots. And when a spot is uh, identified, then you need to express it. So it basically needs to be mapped to its ligand. So there are thousands of ligands. So you need to go into that specific pixel and you need to find out which uh, you know ligand has been attached. So that would be the means of expression. You can uh, do historically you could have done manual identification. So this would be looking at a particular, you know, uh, pixel and then what you're doing you're looking at this uh, green illumination as you can see so this is manual identification and then there are drawbacks so essentially this is very time consuming of course it could be susceptible to errors and there are uh, false positives and false negatives so what you have here is an acceptable uh, sample and then you have geometric coordinates and then here you have essentially an artifact which uh, does not resemble the dots at all. So you are essentially to find out which features are actually useful for you. So for making this automated, which is what uh, is our ongoing work, is you have to pre-process the images uh, typically by filtering out the noise. And then you want to, in every block, you want to segregate from the rest of the image then you want to place a grid inside the blocks to separate out the spots and then you want to identify the spots pixels inside the grid cell so what we want to know is the number of spots the size of the spots the clusters and the intensity right so once we extract the intensity then we do the expression levels so this is uh, from the literature so what they have done is a fully automated spot detection approach for complementary DNA. And what they have done is they have used adaptive thresholds, which is also the uh, techniques that we are going to follow. So one of the things is that if there are no artifacts in the images, then their uh, thresholding works, uh, thresholding schemes work fairly easily. However, when in the presence of artifacts, you know, there are challenges. So what are we? How are we going to address uh, those? That is a major issue for us. So uh, the technique that we have used uh, in, inside the pixel mapping, so we have a so-called distance to pixel concept where in each and every spot within every block, we need to compare with the corresponding pixel of every other block. And that has given us some useful results. <coughs> so. What we do there is uh, all the blocks, as we said, are segregated from the background. 
the grids are placed properly and that has eliminated the artifacts. However, in this particular situation, this artifact was on the edge. So this was done relatively uh, uh, in a straightforward manner. However, if those are internal artifacts, then uh, you have to apply other techniques uh, to solve that problem. So essentially here uh, in the microimaging array imaging, this is where our work has actually started. And uh, there is a lot of data that uh, once you start automating these systems, there's a lot of data you acquire. Then you have to apply multi-level thresholding. You have to eliminate artifacts uh, using novel mechanisms. And what happens is that as you increase the level of thresholding, then the complexity increases, and so does the processing time. And of course, the accuracy improves, right? But then, you know, we have to use uh, novel algorithms for rapid pattern recognition. So this is the challenge right now that we are facing, and this is part of our ongoing work. So this is uh, completion of module two, and now we go into the microarray engineering, which is the third module where we talk about our kit that we are developing right now and what are the various aspects of that. So the first module is the fluorescence image and here there is a little bit of physics behind it. So what you have is uh, excitation of light. We have already talked about it. So there could be different types of lights. There are different types of fluorophores which are part of uh, analytes. And then what you have is it absorbs, the fluorophore absorbs that radiation, right? So if your incoming radiation is 520 nanometers, let us say, then the outgoing emission, the fluorescence is broadband, and that could be typically from 532 to 605. And what you see is a shift in this uh, wavelength that essentially the lower energy uh, radiation which emanates. So what are the system components that uh, we require? We require excitation sources. So we mentioned uh, laser diodes, uh, which will work at 532 nanometers and 620 nanometers. So this is an actual system that we are developing. One is, uh, which is a fixed system, which is having very sophisticated detectors and uh, would be able to do very rapid imaging. And another is a low cost portable system where you are using essentially um, RBG LEDs to work as your excitation source. However, regardless of whatever source you use, you need excitation filters. And essentially, if you are, for example, exciting with green light, right? So 532 nanometers. So then you need a filter for, you know, blocking out that particular light. So you don't need to uh, measure that light going back. So you want to see the, um, the emission spectrum. So the filter arrangement uh, essentially blocks out the excitation source and looks at the emission spectrum, which as we mentioned is at lower energy. And then of course there are detectors, which could be historically CCD detectors, but we are moving on to CMOS detectors at present because of their higher sensitivity. So uh, this is the setup as we had talked about. So it's a laser, the internal optical lens arrangement, which uh, is incident on the proton's samples with fluorophores, and then there's an emission filter, and there is a camera. So what are the specifications? So this is uh, for green laser, 532 nanometers. The output power is 5 milliwatts, and the power stability is uh, 3%. And for red laser, it is 633 nanometers. So again, uh, this power, uh, these are all very standard systems that we have integrated. And uh, for the CCD detectors, uh, we have the specifications as well. And, uh, these are very initial studies that we are preparing for the microarrays that what sort of fluorescence are we able to measure and what dimensions are uh, these dots and what is the spacings of these dots. So these are uh, microarrays which have been fabricated at IIT Bombay. So the next thing that we want to look at is the microfluidics technology. And uh, there, uh, again, some background. 
So we have worked on uh, this sort of microfluidics. Essentially, microfluidics is required because you want to uh, control the dispersal of the analytes. And uh, where uh, you know we have some experience with this sort of uh, arrangements is that you need uh, pumps, you need nozzles, uh, you need pipes, you need reservoirs. So we have done uh, a lot of this work in electronic schooling, uh, especially for single phase as well as two phase schooling, which uh, not only has a flow rate of the fluids, but also they are heated up. And uh, we had a bio microfluidics uh, monitoring setup as well, where you have a fluid which is a synthetic uh, cerebrospinal fluid which flows in a tube. And then, of course, the flow rate is controlled. And then what we do is we heat up this, right? We locally heat it up and we create a bubble. So these bubbles are required to force the fluid through nozzles or to flow them in the tube. So then what we do is uh, we, in this particular example, what we did was we squeezed the uh, tubes and we made the uh, bubbles and the fluids to move faster and the application there was we were actually looking at the clotting of those tubes and uh, the idea is that uh, we can predict the clotting by looking at the velocity of the motion of the thermal bubbles the fluid is basically transparent so you cannot map it but you can map the bubbles and the fluid interface so you can measure the contrast right and that is measured by an optocoupler arrangement and this uh, resulted for us in a um, US uh, patent. So the reason to uh, pull all this up is basically right now what we are doing is we are having uh, proposing a manual uh, pipette kind of arrangement, which will uh, give you uh, basically microliters and then even maybe smaller amounts. And that can be manually, uh, this sort of analytes can be dispensed. But then, uh, you know, we would like to make an electronic arrangement with uh, piezoelectric pipettes, and uh, we can actually uh, drive this system using a piezoelectric system to uh, deposit a finite volume of the analyte and also have a uh, scanning stage so that it can dispense it on a particular XY coordinates. So this is the kind of arrangement where you know, we are looking at a piezoelectric tube and there is a cylinder which basically controls the droplets. And then what we have to be sure, make sure, ensure is essentially that the droplet volume remains uh, steady. So these are some of the specifications from the literature. So you have the nozzle diameters, which are typically in tens of microns. And then this is the nozzle exit velocity which is and the critical speed and the voltage. And uh, this from the literature, you can have as much as, you know, nanoliters or even tens of picoliter arrangements using this sort of thing. So these are, uh, this is a work in progress for us. We are developing this sort of uh, technology in our laboratory. So now comes uh, the microarray fabrication part which is essentially the receptacles on the glass or the quartz lights. And uh, there you can actually have a top-down approach or a bottom-up approach. And uh, this is something where you can use the laboratory facilities yeah. at IIT Bombay. These uh, facilities are available, as I mentioned, uh, to uh, uh, researchers all around India. So if it is a top down approach, then what you're doing is you're essentially etching the surface. You are doing a certain lithography, which is essentially patterning. And once you have patterned the uh, structure, then what you do is you open some windows and in those windows you etch the surfaces. So if you have a glass or a quartz surface, you can etch using uh, some sort of an acid, could be HF. So buffered hydrofluoric acid, you can etch it and you can have other sorts of etching mechanisms as well. And uh, of course, you know, you have access to uh, printed circuit board technology at IIT Bombay as well. In the bottom of uh, approach, 
we are essentially looking at uh, something like 3D printing. And there the problem really is that uh, the material that you have is restricted. Uh, these 3D printers are available and uh, you can actually use either polymer based systems or metal based systems. And uh, mainly they are non transparent in nature, which is fine for us because we are looking at a reflection arrangement, right? So you have the light is incident on the sample and then goes back. So that is a reflection arrangement. So there we don't uh, care that, you know, it could be non transparent. However, if you want to take the image in transmission, then you would have to go back to this uh, glass slide arrangement, which was the top down approach as we talked about. But uh, so far we have not been able to uh, come up with a 3D printing technology for transparent uh, microarray structures. So uh, this is uh, essentially lithographic capabilities which we have in IIT Bombay and which are used essentially using fused silica substrates or ITO coated glass substrates which can be patterned using um, lasers. And uh, if anybody is interested in this sort of uh, technology and the processes, we will be happy to discuss that. So 3D lithography technique. So this is the patterning of the uh, glass substrates that we were talking about. So what you have is uh, you have a glass substrate. You have a metal coating on this. This could be the standard is a chrome gold coating. And then you have a photoresist which is coated on that. And then you have a patterning of the photoresist. So there is an open window. And then what you do is you etch through the metal and then you etch through the glass. And as you can see, this is uh, kind of uh, isotropic etching. So, you know, you get a, some sort of a hemisphere kind of a surface and which is the receptacle that we plan. So what is of interest to us is that what is the size of these receptacles and what is the pitch? So what is the uh, next receptacle? How far away it is? So we have a problem which is that that you know the problem is not the design the problem is the instruments that we are using so if you have the um, lithography tools that we use in our nano lithography systems you can make one micron dots which are too small so why they are too small because essentially this has to be matched with the microfluidic apparatus and that would uh, work only for 100 microns and above so it is to the these capabilities are in that sense gives you uh, feature sizes which are too small on the other hand if you do some sort of a uh, you know mechanical etching so something like a cnc kind of a drilling then the size of the apertures become of the order of millimeter which is too large for our application so this sort of 300 micron is like the holy grail and uh, we are looking at various different technologies which allows us to readily design such apertures. Um, of course, you know, if you have access to laser ablation or laser drilling technologies, um, which is not available right now at IIT Bombay as far to the best of our knowledge, but you know, it can be done commercially. So then you can actually make uh, you know, um, diameters which are 25 micron deep and aspect ratio of four. So that is uh, 100 micron diameters. And then you can create very large uh, number of apertures very, very quickly. So laser drilling is well recommended as a top down approach. So what we have done is we have made initial uh, micro structures. And what we wanted to see is that OK, so um, this is actually like a mask kind of a structure, right? So what we wanted to see was that what is the illumination, uh, you know, the nature of illumination through the holes and, you know, what is the imprint of those holes? OK, so what is the optical printing? So how much, uh, you know, irregularities are we seeing? So what we see is that the uh, pixel intensity uh, is reasonable, reasonably follows. Uh, we don't get uh, much of a shadowing effect. And uh, the size of these pixels are presently 500 microns. 
So we would like to reduce them. So these are done by uh, mechanical uh, methods. And uh, of course, uh, you know, we have to find other ways. Also, um, many different techniques are uh, found to be useful, including 3D printing techniques. So we are looking into all of the above. So uh, the this module is referring to the Uh, Professor Srivastav. Right, so we can actually right. maybe so ask a question. Okay. I, had, I had a few more slides. I had a few more slides. Are we out of time? I thought no, no. we were going to go until 4.30. Yeah, yeah, please continue. continue. Yeah, yeah. We can finish it uh, off and then we can take somebody, questions. I think somebody to, uh, took over control, I think. So that happened. So really? No. Anyway. Yeah, Can it you doesn't go? matter. I'll, I'll go back. OK, I don't know what happened. Actually. No, please share the screen again. Uh, Just a minute. Yeah, the screen is shared, but. Uh, Maybe you can unshare and share again. Uh, yeah, any problem I can share from my side here. Can't. Anyway, I'll go to the uh, PowerPoint screen, which I have. Now we can see that. Okay. Uh, this yeah. So you can see. Yeah, yeah. Please continue. Yes. Yeah. So we are talking about the power supply for our unit, which is calculated to be approximately 50 watts, and it is. As you can see, it is controlling two controllers, and uh, this one controller controls the imaging and uh, imaging which is uh, happening, uh, which is basically controlling the light source and controlling the detectors, and the other controller is controlling the uh, fluidic arrangements. So you can have multiple controllers which are all being controlled simultaneously, and that is the job of the power supply unit. And the problem essentially what we see there is, and this is a well understood problem, is that you are generating a lot of noise, right? This is a compact uh, power supply, which is a switch mode power supply in nature, and is generating a lot of noise. And we are having to develop special shields for that. So these would be uh, electromagnetic shields, which uh, essentially are having, are having low frequency components, which is at 100 hertz, uh, typically the similar to the power line frequency, so 50 hertz, and then it could be interference at high frequencies as well, at 100 megahertz. And uh, this noise is primarily due to the switches which are working in the system. And uh, this is a significant impact on the images that we do. So we have noticed that this sort of EMI effect introduces defective pixels. So uh, we are looking at all these artifacts which are being generated and we are looking as to how to use the shield to prevent uh, this sort of EMI impacts. And uh, we are designing specific shields made out of uh, ferrite materials which we have developed at IIT Bombay. And the idea with these ferrite materials is that it blocks out certain frequencies and it lets other frequencies go. So it is actually a smart electromagnetic shield. So the ongoing work in this uh, microarray system is the system design. As we mentioned that uh, there the issue is one of illumination and excitation and uh, capturing of the image. Another is the design of the microarray slides, which can be done in a top down or a bottom up manner. And also the use of filters and there are other system components such as the power supply and the controllers. So these components have been presently sourced and we are creating, as we said, two types of systems. One is a fixed high performance system. Another is a portable uh, robust uh, imaging system which can work under you know, noisy environments. And we are looking presently what we are doing is we are doing system integration and then we are doing field testing at the same time. So we are actually 
uh, generating noise. We are generating various noise and we are seeing how the system holds up robustly in the presence of noise. So this is the work which is very important. So if it is now going into a field into, let us say, in a village clinic, medical clinic, right, in the presence of a lot of noise, in the presence of um, or, um, acoustic noise, in the presence of vibration, in the presence of electromagnetic noise, you would uh, not be generating artifacts which will create um, erroneous analysis for your biomarker images. And uh, that brings to the end of our talk. We essentially want to uh, acknowledge our faculty colleagues and partners, so Professor Srivastav from um, Biological Sciences at IIT Bombay, Professor Ashutosh Kumar, Professor Achanta Venugopal, Professor Sri Ganesh Prabhu you know, from PIFR, and these are our PhD scholars which have contributed to various aspects of imaging experiments that we have discussed today. And the facilities uh, which have been very useful for us are the nanofabrication facility at IIT Bombay, uh, microsystems and power electronics facility, and proteomics lab also at IIT Bombay, and terahertz facility at Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, and packaging facility at Center for Electronic Materials in Pune. So with that, we conclude our presentation. Professor Srivastava.